the weekly press brief where members of the media have an opportunity to interact with our leadership and most particularly uh, as led by the acting spokesperson of information and publicity, Comrade Shinamasa, I must take this opportunity to welcome you all and thank you all for the continued uh, search for diligence and accuracy in the manner in which you project your, in fact, the national narrative. Just to say, you know, uh, Chef, before we get into my duty is to inform you what will be happening in the media. And I must take this opportunity to advise members of the press. You know, which advice I also borrow from what uh, the Secretary General of the ANC also said when he was closing the, the press brief of the joint meeting between two parties. He said, please go and report and report accurately. Uh, unfortunately, Chef, we have uh, noted with uh, serious concern, though. Uh, I'm not singling them out, but uh, I've seen, I must say, put this open, we have seen the headline from the Daily News. We have seen the headline from the News Day. Uh, we, I'm sure maybe one or two of their colleagues are here. We still welcome them. But uh, it uh, destroys the whole purpose of us having you here to discuss on these issues, when we update you, what happens if they go and create their own stories, completely different from the proceedings that would have been given to them. And the common denominator about those stories is anonymous sources, a source that declined to be named said, and uh, to the extent that we, have, uh, we woke up yesterday to hear that uh, the Director General of the Central Intelligence Organization made a presentation to, to the ANC uh, and ZANPF meeting, which you are aware, it is fake news. So we, I just put this thing, uh, this issue across here to say, when we, we invite you for this press brief, we have nothing to hide. We tell you things as they would have happened. It becomes therefore quite disturbing when people go and uh, choose to do their own stories. We don't seek to interfere with their editorial positions. Some we know they've maintained a hostile position in terms of their editorial, but don't lie in our name. We allowed everyone to come and cover the press brief from the two secretary generals of the two sister revolutionary parties. We don't know where those st stories uh, came from. It is quite unfortunate. I just thought, Chef, it was important to say these things. But uh, without further uh, ado, I must uh, say, uh, take this opportunity to introduce Comrade Machacha. I'm sure you are aware, uh, Comrade Machacha is a political member and the principal of Chitepo Ideological School, uh, which you are aware members of the party get, uh, I, I mean, get ideological training from uh, Comrade Machacha's office. Uh, next to him, of course, he needs no introduction. And then the uh, to my far right is uh, Dr. Simbarashem Bengegu. I'm sure you are aware of him as a former cabinet minister, one of the lowest, longest serving in the Minister of Foreign Affairs as a diplomat. He's also the party secretary for foreign affairs in the political. Uh, Comrade Bengegu, welcome. Comrade Machacha, welcome. It's over to you, Comrade Acting Spokesperson, to engage our colleagues from, from the meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, once again, I thank you very much for coming to our weekly press brief. We were we to have heard this press brief uh, in the morning. So I want to apologize that we were not ready to do so at, at 10 a.m. this morning. So I thank you very much for coming. Uh, before I go into my weekly press brief, I want to highlight or underscore the outcomes of the meetings that the ZANU-PF delegation 
held on Wednesday with the ANC delegation. Then thereafter, I'll go to my uh, written brief. Uh, the meeting on Wednesday, uh, as you, I think, must have gathered, lasted over six hours. Uh, as the Secretary for, for Administration stated, the meeting was the first of its kind and very exhaustive. And I wanted to say that it was a no holds barred meeting, characterized by brutal frank frankness, brutal kindness, zeroing in and dwelling on the material conditions obtaining both in South Africa and Zimbabwe. But I need to say that the discussions were held in an atmosphere of cordiality. But we, the discussions were very frank, very candid. I wanted to say that the two revolutionary sister parties were able to find each other during that meeting. I should say we rediscovered each other, and I think we got our bearings correct. And as we go into, our, into the future, I think we have set our compass in the right direction. First, we agreed that Zimbabwe and South Africa are equal sovereign states. Zimbabwe is not a province of South Africa. That we agreed very clearly. Zim South Africa, in the context of international relations, South Africa is not a big brother to Zimbabwe. It has no overseer role to play on Zimbabwe or in the region. It has no mediatory role to play in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, or in any other country. And not being a province of South Africa, it follows that there is no interventionist approach to the way that South Africa would relate to us. That became quite clear in our discussions. And therefore, we put paid to any interventionist approach in the way we relate to each other. I also wanted to highlight that ANC and ZANU-PF were able to identify, clearly identify, the ex existential threats which are arranged against the ANC and ZANU-PF is revolutionary movements, and not just against those two, but against the rest of liberation movements in our region. We are aware of the ex external and internal forces working day and night to undermine the liberation movements. Also agreed and a point I want to highlight is that we agreed that we should strengthen integration of our region, of our economies. And of course, we realize, of course, that success in this endeavor will take time. It will be a gradual, progressive approach, but we must dismantle the apartheid economy relationship with the economies of its neighbors. That we have to do. We cannot allow it to perpetuate as is currently the case. We cannot allow a situation where economies outside the South African economy are warehouse economies. I think on that we were agreed that we should work seriously towards putting 
regional integration first on our agenda. And so, as we go forward, our meetings are going to dwell more on, our, on the economy, economy of individual countries, economies of the region, and how we can integrate those economies. In fact, the point was made that, of course, the South African economy is more integrated to Europe and not to the continent. And this is a matter that needs to be corrected since we live in the same geographical area. So the skewed nature of our economic relationship is a matter that needs to be addressed. I also wanted to highlight a very key outcome of our engagement with the ANC, and that is that we are a victim of fake news and social media. And that fake news and social media should never, never set our agenda, should never define our relationship to each other, which I think became a, a, a problem in the past. As we go forward, we should increasingly address the issue of fake news and social media so that they don't define our relationship, they don't set our agenda, they don't do anything of the sort. Which is why we agreed that, and they agreed, there is no crisis in Zimbabwe. There is no crisis in South Africa. There is no crisis in our sub-region. But each individual country has challenges. In our case, I have in previous media briefings, I've said we had the challenge of Cyclone Idai and resources had to be deployed to meet that challenge. We then had challenges arising from COVID-19. The lockdown measures have impacted negatively on our economy. Those are challenges. We also have had challenges of successive droughts, two, three years successive droughts, which have impacted negatively on our agricultural growth and consequently also on our economy. Those are challenges. They don't constitute a crisis requiring interventionist approach to the way we relate to each other. That I need to emphasize. We also agreed that uh, uh, we should consolidate the gains of our revolution, the gains of our liberation. As liberation movements come under attack, it is imperative for liberation movements to band together and seek to fulfill the objectives of our liberation struggle. It is very, very, very significant. And we agreed that from now onwards, we should band together to maximize the, on the gains of our liberation. So that we agreed. Just as much as we agreed that the external threats coming from sources we identified are arranged against the ANC and ZANU-PF and other liberation movement governments, whether it be Frelimo, whether it be SWAPO, whether it's MPLA, whether it's Chama Chama Pinduzi, the threats are the same and the source of the threats is the same. So we agreed that it is our responsibility as liberation movements to fend off those forces, to defend our sovereignty, to defend the gains of our liberation, will come whatever may. We also agreed uh, that uh, sanctions are a major handicap to the growth of Zimbabwe's economy. And therefore, ANC joined ZANU-PF once again. It has already also been calling for the unconditional lifting of sanctions. But we again made a renewed joint statement that economic sanctions should be removed unconditionally. 
There was also the issue about the space, political space that ZANU-PF considers is being given to the G40 elements who are fugitives from justice and who are resident in South Africa. We discussed that issue and we believe that as we go forward, the hope not being that we had observed will come to a stop. We agreed, and this was also admitted, that Western countries are continuing to pile pressure upon pressure on the government of South Africa to act on perceived political crisis in Zimbabwe. And we know where the problems are. South Africa's media, economy, is still very much apartheid controlled with objectives, of course, to perpetuate the inequalities that are prevalent in South Africa. So we recognize that handicap which is prevailing in South Africa and which militates and piles pressure upon pressure on our sister revolutionary party. So we agreed that we should never have communication that is through social media, through media communication, that we should meet regularly. And this is a resolution that came out from our joint meeting on, on Wednesday that we were going to, as ZANU-PF, going to pursue very vigorously to insist that we meet regularly as sister revolutionary parties to exchange notes on our, the material conditions obtaining not just in our respective countries but also in the region and how we can fight off and fend off those forces. And we agree that when we meet top on our agenda on a regular basis will be discussion on our respective economies and the economies of the region. So I thought I should start with that before I go into my what would, were it not for this meeting, would have been my weekly briefing. Let me now read my brief. Over the past weekend, the party through the Department of Commissariat held its provincial coordinating committees, committee meetings throughout the remaining 10 provinces. We had, on Saturday and Sunday, uh, PCC meetings in the eight provinces outside Bulawayo and outside Harare. So we would want to applaud the commissariat department and the political members who went out as deployees to various provinces to interface with our party structures. Political members took time to explain the party position on various fundamental issues affecting the country and the party, as well as report to our people on the progress we are making in fulfilling the manifesto in fighting COVID-19. Emphasis was placed on the irreversibility of the land reform program. I must say that we are going to have occasion when we can display uh, uh, the achievements that we've been able to make in the past two years under the new dispensation. So that you are aware, you become aware that the government has not been sleeping. It has been implementing our major should we say failure has been to broadcast those achievements and we are going to have occasion when we can broadcast achievements that we can take you to to see for yourself so that it's not like we are proper it's propaganda we can take you to some of those achievements so that you can see for yourself what the new dispensation has been able to do but of course they are aware of the efforts that uh, the government has done to contain the spreading of COVID-19, to fight COVID-19. You are all aware 
This is why we are here, we are alive. Members were also informed, that is, ZANPF members, that the ongoing regularization of the land reform, which is expected to bring finality to the land question, is enshrined in the supreme law of the country, which we adopted in 2013. The Provincial Coordinating Committees also applauded the various economic measures being adopted by His Excellency uh, Comrade E. D. Mnangagwa's government to stabilize the economy, such as the foreign exchange auction rate system is referred to as Dutch foreign exchange auction system, which has resulted in the stabilization of prices whilst bringing an end to the run, runaway parallel exchange rate. The provincial coordinating committees also applauded the program on Fumfuza that government is undertaking through the Ministry of Agriculture and in which our people are actively participating. This Fumfuza program entails those without any draft power in particular those are targeted. Without drought power, we have in the past benefited from presidential input scheme, being asked to dig walls. And we were told the area, the, how many walls they have to dig, and they use a manure if they have any, and they will then qualify to be given one bag of AN, one bag of compound D, in one bag of lime, so that we maximize productivity even on a very small piece of ground. So that is a program in which our membership is in the rural area A1, A2, all the settlement are actively participating. And we, for that, we applaud the government. And we have asked that we be given uh, progress reports on how this program is being undertaken. I was uh, deployed to March East on last Saturday, and the report was that more than 250 households had been trained in this program. And of that, as of that week, already something like 80,000 households had fulfilled the requirements of Fumfuza, digging up the necessary walls, and we are now ready to receive the presidential inputs. Uh, let me refer to something that we all felt devastated. ZANU-PF was devastated and disturbed by the shooting incident which took place in Chivu, where assailants killed a soldier and injured one, and in the process disarming them and running away with their firearms. The soldiers, as you all know, were on routine duty enforcing lockdown measures which are aimed at mitigating the spread of COVID-19. ZANU-PF condemns unreservedly the killing of our patriotic soldier and the injured one by this, and injuring the one who is hospitalized, ex-perpetrated by these assailants. We are further taken aback by statements of disparagement and ridicule coming from the MDC Alliance rank in file, where they appear to be celebrating the attacks on the security forces while pouring their hearts out for the assailants. We have taken note. We have taken note. I wanted to say to Chamisa and Biti, they should not be like children playing with fire it will be very dangerous for them. We know what they have they've been doing. We are not surprised by the stance they are taking. 
We are aware that the MDC has been training, sending to Serbia and Moldova renegades who are being trained to prepare Molotov cocktails to come and cause mayhem and violence in our country. We are very clear that the MDC Alliance is a party worships violence and continues to maintain violent structures which they characterize as vanguard resistance committees, which, as you know, in 2018, we are responsible for the orgy of violence and also for the 14 to 16 January last year violence. They perpetrated violence in our streets, in our communities, targeting security forces and innocent ZANU-PF members. I wanted to say to BT and Chamisa, don't play with fire like little children. You must proceed forthwith to dismantle your violent structures. We also wanted to call upon those countries, Serbia and Moldova, who host such violent training. We also wanted to call upon those countries, which we know, which are funding the perpetration of these violent activities, training people like they are militia, like they are soldiers, outside the borders of Zimbabwe. And you think that ZANU-PF government will tolerate that? We will not tolerate. And I'm sure that when they do, like the assailants, the chief of assailants, the security forces will account for them, each and every one of them. And there should be no complaining to anyone when people who have been trained in Moldova and Serbia come on our shores and are accounted for. We should not receive any complaints from anybody, including the U.S. ambassador. ZANU-PF is grateful to our security services. We have risked their lives daily to maintain peace in our country. We can condemn in all earnest the attack on the two soldiers. We will not tolerate such attacks on our members of the security. The tracking down of those assailants and their subsequent death in the should save during a shootout with law enforcement agents should be taken as a stern warning to all like-minded violent mongers in our society that our security services forces will never allow them to disturb the peace and harmony that we've enjoyed in our country since our independence. Finally, finally, on this issue, about the attack on our soldiers. The party upholds, up, uploads the role played by our people, ordinary people, particularly the residents of Chifu, who provided first aid to the two soldiers and ferried them to hospital. Indeed, it reflects upon the symbiotic relationship between our people and our security services. Long may it continue. That is the attitude that will guarantee peace and stability and tranquility in our country. Allow me now to say something on fake abductions. The Revolutionary Party remains concerned by stage-managed and faked abductions involving members and associates of the opposition party. It is now common knowledge that these abductions always occur okay each time the nation is having important diplomatic encounter with other states or important international institutions. They aim being to smear our government, 
the 31st July threatened demonstrations were intended to coincide with the holding of the SADC summit. And I'm sure that uh, they will not stop at that, they will try, they know that the UN General Assembly is, it? Yes. is coming up. So watch again the antics of the opposition. The aim always is to try to characterize our country as being in a state of war, in a state of crisis, something that is always try, they try to fake. In addition, these fake abductions manifest in very theatrical circumstances. Remember the case of Dr. Peter Magombei, who announced his adoption in, in courts and disappearance in courts, and later announced that he had found himself. As it turned out, of course, he was a candidate for U.S. scholarship. So he had to justify why he earned that scholarship. Interestingly, interestingly, the party is following with keen interest the documentary which has exposed the Honorable Joanna Mamombe and her two fellow MDC Alliance activists. I'm talking about the one which faked abductions and disappearance and stage managed those incidents. I'm sure that you are all aware of a documentary that is circulating, which we've all picked up. And when you look at that document, it's very clear. They engaged in an illegal demonstration in Warren Park. But they went on to claim that they had been abducted only to re-engage under controversial circumstances, claiming to have been tortured and injured. Interestingly, no signs of internal and physical injuries were found on any of those ladies. They also, during the time they say they were under torture, the documentary shows they've been found to have been in constant communication with some MDC Alliance officials and also traveling around the country during that time. If you are a captive, you are being tortured. There is no way you can have the freedom to communicate with your friends. There is no way you could be found in another part of the country. No way. But that is what the documentary now reveals. As a revolutionary party, we are grateful to some members of the fourth estate who are also assisting towards the truth through investigative journalism particularly the documentary which has exposed the fake abductions, abductions and disappearances. I wanted to applaud the fourth estate. And as I have always said, whether we are talking of corruption or any evil of society, please feel free to investigate, but come with evidence. Once it's evidence-based, I'll be the first to shake your hand and congratulate you, because we want to expose all the evils that are afflicting our country. And so, investigative journalism, yes. But fake and stage-managed abductions and outcomes of investigations, which are stage-managed, no. A hundred times, no. So this documentary shows that the investigative journalism is what, that is what is there for, to investigate what anyone would want to put under the carpet, whether it's government or anyone. If they, any, any corruption is committed and people want to sweep it away, and through investigative journalism, you expose it. Please, I'll be the first to shake your hand.
congratulate you and to wish you well and to, to give you a message that you should continue doing more of that work. We need more of that work. But these ladies, according to the documentary, went about their daily errands when they were under when they were under captive, when they were captives. They also were transmitting on their WhatsApps the messages that in fact have been investigated are WhatsApp messages during the time they claim to have been abducted. We are interested to hear what their response is. We have also found anyway that the ladies or some of the ladies were also candidates for scholarship to go and study in the USA. Those are the benefits that we get from the USA scholarships of people who have been corrupted. If there is one corruption, it is to be corrupted to the worst corruption is to be corrupted to be treasonous to your own country. That is the worst corruption. Not people want to make money for their personal gain. But if you are corrupted to a point where you are an enemy of your country, you are treasonous, you are a sellout, that is the worst form of corruption. When you eat that money, please examine your conscience, your dirty conscience. So we keep committed to seeing justice prevailing in Zimbabwe. And as a party, we encourage our law enforcement agents to intensify their investigations to put an end to this distasteful culture of fake abductions. Let me also say, uh, this is an announcement. Next Friday, that will be the 18th, isn't it? Next Friday, ZANU-PF is going to be holding an e-gala. E-gala because it will not take the form of the usual galas that we have been accustomed to in the past. It will be in HICC, artists will come to uh, perform, and this will all be beamed on television, on electronic media, on social media, on radios, for you to enjoy. It will be for the whole night. We are, we are celebrating, we are taking, it's a belated celebration of our 40 years of independence. And also we are celebrating, it's a belated celebration of our national, of our heroes. Those who died and are um, buried in unmarked graves, graves, graves in Tanzania, Zambia, Botswana, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, we want to take the opportunity to honor them through that celebration. Uh, so we are dubbing the, the, uh, the uh, celebration, the Igala Zim 840. We are now 40 years of independence, as you know. We, as I pointed out, we are not allowing members of the public, they will not attend. It will be an online gala, and we hope that you will enjoy this in the comfort of your homes. That brings an end to my, to my brief. Thank you very much, Comrade uh, Acting Spokesperson. Uh, this is an opportunity where you can ask your questions. My, our colleagues from the media, your questions. And I normally point to this occasion, you know, to this uh, moment as the most crucial moment because I feel this is the moment where you can ask your questions and then before you write headlines on the basis of lies, clarify or 
you know, as it were, seek explanations on things that you may feel you really need to know from the leadership of the party. So your opportunity. Identify yourself. Sorry, sorry, say that again. Help. First, to your first question, you say that they said they are coming back. Clearly, that is outside the agreement that we, we reached in, in the meeting on Wednesday. I have not, uh, not followed what they said after they arrived in South Africa. But what I can categorically say, uh, as I mentioned, the meeting was very frank and candid. We agreed that Zimbabwe and South Africa are equal sovereign states. And that on the basis of being equal sovereign states, there is no interventionist approach to anything that we relate to each other. That we agreed. And therefore, it follows that there is no way an ANC delegation will come to Zimbabwe to interfere in our domestic affairs. Firstly, we also agreed that there is no crisis in Zimbabwe. That we agreed. No crisis in Zimbabwe, like in every other country. And in fact, and I will not want to go into this, we charged other countries in SADC, the challenges that they are facing. But clearly we dwelled at length on the challenges that the South Africans are facing the South, ourselves are facing. And I've already put on the table what those challenges are. They do not need any outside interference. What Zimbabwe needs at the moment is access to capital, which, because of sanctions, we are unable to do. Which leaves Zimbabwe only one option, to lift itself up by our own bootstraps which is what we have been doing over the past 20 years. With respect to any assistance offered, whether by South Africa, by anybody, let me put it on record that, and I'm also talking as a former Minister of Finance, Zimbabwe has not received any assistance of whatever nature from South Africa, from the South African economy, other than us selling or importing from South Africa. If that is the assistance you mean, maybe. But if you are talking of direct assistance, Zimbabwe has not received a cent since independence, for your information. As you know, the, the, from independence to 1994, it was an apartheid regime. And Zimbabwe wasted a lot of resources in not only harboring our colleagues, the ANC cadres who are fighting the apartheid, but also being subjected to, should we say, to negative, negative approach in our relationship from apartheid regime. I want to repeat, we have not received a cent as Zimbabwe from the apartheid economy or from the post-apartheid government. That I can tell you off the end without any uh, pre-verification. So the assistance which is now being touted about, if it's true, if it's true, clearly if they've not stood by us economically in the past 20 years when sanctions were imposed on us, how can they, anyone seek to stand by us economically when we are almost out of the woods? Once we sort out our agriculture, 
And we are going to undertake a lot of irrigation. And on one of my briefs, I will have something to say on the measures that government is taking to beef up our agriculture. Once we get out of our, out of the woods, and it's not a very long that we'll get out of our woods, we'll make our economy. We will need, not need any assistance promised or, or not implemented at all. So I want to respond to your question to say we have not received any cent from South Africa since independence, whether from apartheid government or from the post-apartheid government of the ANC. We have not. What we can say is that we have received diplomatic and moral support after we embarked on the land reform. That I can say. And as you know, at our request, at our request, not only as an imposition, we had a very immediated dialogue in our country, which resulted in the inclusive government in 2009. At our request, Mbeki did not impose himself on us. We requested him in order to defend the gains of our revolution, which were being threatened because of threatened military invasion on Zimbabwe by the Blair government. If it had not been thwarted by Mbeki, we could have been talking a different story. We could be actually, right now, still fighting the British like we did during the first and second Chimurek. And we are still fighting them during this land reform program. We are still fighting them. The British and the Western countries will never accept and agree and forgive us for taking the land and redistributing it to our people. They will never. We are the first country, don't forget, first country to ever do what we are doing, which is what we pointed out to the ANC delegation. We have taken our land. You need us if we have to empower your people. We need each other. They have to empower their people also in the same way that we've empowered our people. It's our revolutionary obligation as revolutionary parties to fulfill the gains of the liberation. Whether it's here or in South Africa or in Namibia or in Mozambique. As you know, in Mozambique, again, we went to great lengths to fight apartheid which were assisting Renam in order to ensure that the Frelimo government survives. And we succeeded. We are not a rich country, but we were able to, 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 to do our revolutionary duty in that regard. And it, we did it without assistance from anybody, from anybody, including South Africa. We never received any help from South Africa the years we spent in Mozambique. Similarly, we went again in a revolutionary duty with Angola and Namibia to DRC to prop up, to defend them from external aggression. Again, we did it through our own resources. We never received a cent from South Africa. We received the collaboration of the Angolans and the Namibians. Of course, we know that there are other countries which then came to try to exploit the opportunities now created by the political stability that we had established in the DRC. There are other people now enjoying the benefits. Zimbabwe is not there. But for us, we remain very proud of our contribution, not just to the region, but also in charting the revolutionary path to fulfill the objectives of the liberation struggle. I hope I've answered you. Yes, Lawrence. Speak aloud.
Well, thank you very much, uh, our moderator and colleagues. It's already stated friendly and sisterly organizations only come to the help of each other on invitation. We help each other on invitation. We enjoy sovereign equality both as political parties and as nations. Therefore, no party, especially a sister party, can impose itself on another sister party. It is common knowledge that uh, uh, some individuals in our sister party, the ANC, had been made to believe that there was a crisis in Zimbabwe. We are not sure how uh, they became uh, convinced of that, but some of them came here with that notion. However, in our meeting, which lasted the whole day, the notion of a crisis in Zimbabwe was quickly dismissed. And the both sides agreed that there was no crisis in Zimbabwe. Both sides agreed that yes, there were challenges. But these challenges were not unique to Zimbabwe. Both Zimbabwe and South Africa faced challenges. And to want to classify challenges as a crisis would be wrong. And we agreed on that. Once we had agreed on that, that there was no crisis in Zimbabwe, there were challenges, we spent most of the day discussing the challenges that faced both South Africa and Zimbabwe, and how we as former liberation movements can work together and co cooperate in order to overcome these challenges as neighbors, as sister parties. That's how we spent most of our time. In fact, no time was spent at all on discussing crisis because it was quickly agreed that does not exist. Therefore, the question uh, of a sister party coming to the country of another sister party to establish bilateral relations with the opposition parties is unheard of. Is unheard of. That can only happen in the context of mediation. And mediation can only occur with the consent of the conflicting parties. But where there is no conflict, where there is no crisis, then there is no room for mediation. And therefore, no purpose would be served by trying to play a mediatory role where there is no conflict, where there is no crisis. And more importantly, where there is no consent of the parties involved. I know why you are asking this question. Because this point actually was made quite clear by the two leaders of our delegations, the two secretaries general, on Wednesday after the meeting, there was no mention of there being a crisis. You saw the communique. There is no reference to the idea of a crisis, but the idea of cooperation. 
to meet, uh, to, 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 to meet head on the challenges that face both uh, our countries. But I know why you are asking. My counterpart uh, on lending in South Africa had a media briefing where she reverted back to the original position that there was a crisis in Zimbabwe. <laughs> and therefore, they needed to come back here to resolve that crisis. But surely, how can you unilaterally reverse a common position that uh, the two delegations arrived at? That there was no crisis, there were challenges, and let's cooperate uh, to resolve the crisis, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the challenges which prevail in both countries. So I, I want to assure you that uh, uh, it is not normal you know, for a sister former liberation movement to impose itself on another. No. And therefore, we only hope and in fact believe that uh, the views so expressed were individual views, and we'll be very surprised if they are in fact uh, the uh, common position of the African National Congress. Thank you. Yes, I want to emphasize the point uh, my colleague makes here. I still want to believe, I have not listened to the audio, to the interview, but I want to believe that if she said what you put us, what you, you, you put to me, uh, I doubt if it is representative of the views of the delegation. Uh, now that you've brought it to my attention, uh, I will ask our Secretary for Administration to get in touch with his counterpart so that they can clarify because if it's true and it represents the ANC delegation viewpoint, uh, it will be an act of bad faith in terms of our deliberations. So I will not want to speak more on this subject. I will ask the sector for our sector for administration, Dr. Mpofu, to get in touch with his counterpart and clarify whether the views expressed by Lindy Wezulu are the views of the ANC delegation to start with, and also whether they are the views of the ANC party. Uh, emphasizing again that Zimbabwe is not a colony of any country. Uh, we are not a colony of Britain. We are not a colony of any country. And those views which were expressed, if they were expressed, are symptomatic of a colonizer coming to, to, to sort out the colonized in the country which, they, which is a colony. And I want to emphasize we are not a colony. We are an independent, sovereign country. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, just for the sake of the, the problem, journalists here asked about uh, whether it is proper for a diplomat, the conduct say, for example, in the case of the U.S. Ambassador who sought to request to meet the ANC delegation, yet his structures of government here in Zimbabwe probably to raise criticism again. I'm sure that is a question that has been posed to you, Dr. Mbiyan. Well, I would be most surprised if such a request would be granted. Because it's extremely irregular. Yes, we understand it was made, but uh, I'm almost certain that uh, uh, 
it cannot be granted because uh, it's very unusual in diplomatic practice. Just to mention that um, uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Koblet S.B. Moyo, who is a, also a member of Politburo, was in the meeting. And he has no doubt in his mind that we never discussed the issue of them coming here. And that they will not come. He is very much in the picture with respect to what went on in that meeting. The matter was never raised that they want to come, and if they raised it, we told them it will not happen. Just just a brief rejoinder. In fact, uh, as part of the general you know, discussion, the ZANU PF side pointed out that it would be absolutely inconceivable for ZANU PF to send a delegation to South Africa to go and engage with the, the DA and the Malemas to check whether uh, uh, what we learned from the ANC was correct. Mm. You know very well, before you go there, what they will say. So I go there. You know exactly what they're going to say before you even go there. Anyone who'd come and talk to the opposition here, you know the lies that they always tell, and they repeat, and they regurgitate, and totally, totally unverifiable. But they are made anyway. And of course, uh, when it was uh, you know, put to, to our colleagues uh, from the ANC, yeah, they hadn't actually looked at it from that perspective, and they, they realized that <laughs> they would find that totally unacceptable. If it is unacceptable, unacceptable to them that a sister revolutionary party goes and establishes bilateral consultations, you know, behind the back of their sister party, it would be wrong. So why, why should it be right when it is uh, now in the situation of Zanubia? So, really, the issue uh, died in the meeting. It is in that context that we also raised the issue about them hope nobbing yes. with the G40 fugitives from justice. And we pointed out very clearly that we found that to be a hostile act against Zanupir. And we asked them to clarify whether they are treated in South Africa as fugitives or political activists. No, it's or refu or as refugees, as refugees. If they are refugees, the international law should apply. International law does not allow refugees to be act politically active in the, in the countries which is hosting them. Uh, it's very important that we, we say this because it is something that we, we clearly discussed. It's not right that they should hope no with the G40 elements in South Africa. And we pointed out to them that, in fact, they are fugitives from justice. And I must acknowledge that they said, if, if that is the situation, why are you not applying for extradition and this is advice that we got from them which i'm sure our law enforcement agents will be able to 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 take up with but whatever it is it's not right for a, a friendly neighboring country to harbor political malcontents who remain hostile 
against a neighboring country, which in fact the G40 elements are. As I see it, the bottom line is that we are going to meet frequently. And I'm sure that we are going to honor this resolution uh, sooner rather than later. It, it will give us once again an opportunity to put on the table in a very frank, candid manner whatever the material conditions which are obtaining in our respective two countries. We also, you need to also uh, understand that uh, when discussing about who is uh, exploiting who in our economic relationship, we put on the table that we are there aware that the bulk of our gold which is smuggled is smuggled by South African citizens with South African number plates. If you go to people who are roaming our in Chiazwa, there are South African citizens wanting to, to buy illegally our diamonds. If you go to all our gold producing centers, especially under the artisanal miners, what you find there are South African number plates. They have the cash, so they are buying and smuggling it out to South Africa. We pointed out that. We also pointed out that, in fact, we are there aware also that uh, we, the platinum companies here, we, we export platinum to South Africa for refining. And we are only paid for one mineral. As you know, the platinum ore contains not just platinum, but I think three or four other <laughs> minerals, rhodium, mm. Up to Africa, it? silver, mm. and so on. And we only get paid for one because we have no refinery. Something that if we are able to establish a refinery, we should be able to correct. So these are issues that uh, uh, we need to have frank discussions upon, including the vast majority of our Zimbabweans who occupy very, uh, should we say, important uh, positions in their industry, in their commerce, in their banking, in their insurance companies, and so forth. And making a contribution to the economy of South Africa. This is not acknowledged, but as we deliberate in future meetings on the economy, these are issues that we should put on the table. And of course, our own view is Zanupiv well put by our head of delegation, Dr. Mpof, is that as long as the skewed nature of our economic relationship is not addressed in a serious manner, migration, no one will stop the migration. We have to reverse that, to correct that skewed nature. Where our economies surrounding South Africa are what they've been for the past centuries since diamonds and gold was discovered on the land. We need to correct that. If we do, then that will stem any tide of migration, whether from Zimbabwe or from any other country from our region. And that is the path that we should travel upon, all of us, ANC and ZANU-PF and other members of the SADAC community. I thank you very much for your coming.